pushing for more sanctions, the other ones are pulling. Also, in terms of distribution, it's again Poland and the Baltics who are ready to bear the cost of sanctions, whereas others like Austria and Hungary are pushing for less sanctions and lobbying for some financial carve-outs. Uh, the discussion in the EU dominates um, by the narrative of fear of Russia's retaliation and the desire to avoid economic fallout. While the, the West is more ready to impose hard hitting sanctions, it's all about the equation. Is the Western readiness to bear the sanction costs higher than Russia's uh, readiness and willingness to bear the costs? And we, we need to remember that Russia is now mentally and economically more prepared to weather the new sanctions. There is no element of surprise as we saw in 2014. Uh, this time is different and the price uh, for deterring Russia is much higher than it was in 2014 and that inherently implies higher costs for the West. When it comes to what type of sanctions are currently on the table, um, that depends on which table we're looking at. The US's table is much fuller. It's um, Washington is ready to impose high impact sanctions of massive consequences. The EU is less so, so we won't see full alignment, but the following sanctions measure are discussed that both allies will be ready to impose if Russia decides to invade. First one is placing Russian banks on the SDN list. Back then in 2014, only several Russian banks and energy companies ended up on the sectoral sanctions list. This is a much lighter version. This time we're talking about full blocking sanctions and um, largest state-owned and also private banks could be under fire this time. It's VTB, Sberban, Gazprom Bank, uh, Rossil Horse Bank, potentially Russia uh, Direct Investment Fund, and Alpha Bank, one of the largest uh, private banks. Altogether, that could account for 60% of the nation's uh, banking assets. The second option is extending uh, sanctions on Russian sovereign debt. Currently, we have sanctions on ruble and uh, dollar-denominated denominated bonds and only on the primary market, and that could be extended to the secondary market. Having said that, since uh, April last year, the share of the non-residents has dropped to uh, below 19%, uh, so there is also less exposure, less impact. The third option is a novel one. It's imposing expert controls on US-made technology for Russian defense sector that could target the um, expert of critical and emerging technologies such as uh, microchips, uh, semiconductors um, and um, artificial intelligence, for example. The US can employ the so-called foreign direct product rule, uh, which is if you want extraterritorial sanctions of expert controls that could uh, have a very vast impact in various markets, not just um, Russia. Uh, but it's fair to say that this is a long term effect. Expert control will only work in the long run. We won't see any immediate uh, impact. Uh, the, the next option is energy. Um, as I said, energy is something that uh, neither the US nor the EU want to touch. Uh, Europe currently imports 40% uh, of Russian gas. Uh, Russia is also top three oil supplier to the US. Uh, having said that, uh, the EU and UK announced that they would be prepared to curtail technology and funding to Russia's new gas project, something that was never targeted by sanctions. And the other project that could be under fire is halting Nord Stream 2, a toxic pipeline that has divided allies um, transatlantically and also within the EU. And this is something that uh, Washington and at least Berlin uh, still under question, but there will be much more pressure not to launch the pipeline. Sanctioning oligarchs surprisingly didn't uh, see a lot of uh, public discussion. This is an option with much less uh, blowback uh, than the other ones. Uh, the, U, um, the US would be willing to use its classified list from the CATSA sanctions, previous sanctions in 2017. The UK has recently expanded its designation criteria that would target Russian oligarchs in the key sectors of the Russian economy. 
Um, where there is no appetite is again the energy sector to hold the current supplies of Russian gas and oil and SWIFT, despite uh, being featured as this nuclear option, this um, sanctions option is really not on the table, despite the fact that we hear that everything is on the table. And uh, the ban on the conversion of ruble and dollars is much more probable than uh, cut off from SWIFT. My third point is about Russia's resilience. We heard a lot about Fortress Russia strategy, the so-called strategy that Russia has pursued since 2014. And in comparison with 2014, uh, Russia is much better prepared to face sanctions on the macroeconomic level. Um, everything looks quite uh, rosy. Russia's economy is protected by ample international reserves that currently stand at $640 billion, one of the largest in the world. Uh, it also has a low sovereign debt levels and a conservative fiscal policy that is uh, concentrated on uh, accruing uh, uh, windfall from the hydrocarbons and not on spending. There is also less uh, exposure uh, as I said, for example, the lower share of non-residents on the OFZ market, there is also less international borrowing. Russia's interconnectedness also works as a shield, uh, so sector, uh, sanctions on the energy sector and SWIFT are not really on the table. Um, the other two strategies uh, that Russia has pursued is import substitution and de-dollarization. Import substitution um, has been um, Partially successful in certain sectors, mainly low tech items was possible to substitute, but we're not talking about uh, self sufficiency in high tech. Russia still depends on Western suppliers when it comes to hardware, software, uh, and semiconductors. For example, uh, there is a 70 90% dependence on Western software for all major Russian banks and energy companies. The strategy of de-dollarization has been more successful than import substitution and we saw a substantial decrease of the US dollar in the composition uh, in Russia's international reserves. That has dropped from 40% in 2014 to 16 now. Uh, but this is a top-down which is easier to pursue than uh, let's say import substitution. In cross-border payments, we also saw a diversification, but the main beneficiary here is the euro, not the Russian ruble or Chinese yuan. The share of the US dollar decreased uh, from 80% in uh, 2013 to 55 in uh, 2020, and the euro is now um, accounts for 27% of cross-border payments. So, in the mid to short term, uh, economic stability is guaranteed. But if we're looking at the longer term perspective, these fortress strategies are all about um, constraining domestic spending, which is sacrificed, uh, um, economic growth is sacrificed for the sake of stability. And this is this post-Soviet type of stability that we're talking about. Uh, Russian economy has stagnated and the growth was around 0.8%, uh, whereas peer emerging economies uh, grew at uh, the 3 uh, percentage uh, point. Uh, sanctions will constitute a persistent risk for the Russian economy. It will limit the, the state for maneuver in terms of budget flexibility and deter future investments. My last point is about China, uh, how China will be able and willing to blunt a new sanctions will obviously depend on the scope of new sanctions and Chinese uh, behavior has also become more assertive. But looking back at 2014, we can see um, a few lessons uh, we can learn from the situation back then. And uh, with China, political support doesn't always translate into political dividends. Um, if Russian banks are placed on the SDN, uh, we can expect little support uh, from China. Back then in 2014, when we were only uh, when there were only sectoral sanctions, a lot of uh, private banks uh, were very reluctant to deal with Russian uh, sanctioned companies. And there were a lot of cases of overcompliance, either due to the lack of regional expertise, but mainly also fear in uh, US extraterritorial sanctions. So the, the only way to support um, 
companies uh, in Russia if they get sanctioned is via uh, government affiliated institutions. China State owned Silk Road Fund, uh, China Development Bank, and Export uh, Import Bank of China have been the main key institutions that provided lending to Russian sanctions companies. On expert controls, uh, China's help can be instrumental in the long term, but again, not so much in the short term. Uh, currently, the supply chains of semiconductors are globalized. Um, Taiwan and South Korea are the main nodes of this production, and China has uh, indigenous production that accounts only for 20%. But in the long term, uh, China is prepared to invest a lot of subsidies um, and allocate a lot of funds to onshore its production of semiconductors. And if expert controls are placed on these particular items, by 2025-2035, China plans to localize up to 70% of the production of semiconductors. If Russian banks are cut off from SWIFT, there is a lot of discussion that China can step in and uh, alleviate the, this measure. Well, if we look at Chinese SIPs, which is alternative to SWIFT, it still has a very limited international reach. Uh, the size of SIPs is very small, only 0.3% of SWIFT, and also the share of uh, Chinese Yuan is quite marginal. So there is also a limitation to what extent uh, China can help Russia. Two countries did sign a memorandum of understanding and collaboration between Russian alternative to SWIFT and Chinese, but this collaboration still remains on the level of technical consultations. So in the long run, uh, comparing with what we saw in 2014, China will definitely capitalize on Russia's isolation. It will not provide uh, favorable interest rates or favorable help. And they will not be able to, to rescue Russia from all sanctions. It will not be a panacea. It can buy time for Russia to adapt, but it will um, have a limitation as to what it can uh, do when uh, all sweeping sanctions are imposed. I'll stop here and uh, look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Thanks very Maria, much for, this, for this excellent, excellent overview. overview. Um, um, Maybe please, Maybe everyone, please everyone switch, switch off, your, off mics. your mics. So I'm getting feedback. Okay, so, so uh, while, while well, we wait well, for we other go. questions um, from the audience, and there's a chat function, you should be able to to use it. Um, I'll start off with a couple of uh, uh, a couple of broader questions. So maybe my first is, uh, Maria, in your view, what are some of the lessons learned uh, that we can uh, already see now in terms of how the European Union and the member states prepared the current package of san sanctions. Uh, are there some aspects that could have been done better? Uh, I mean, in terms of speed, efficiency, consensus building, uh, or, or intensity of the measures? Yes, indeed, the, the EU is the one here that needs to learn a few lessons when it comes to the imposition of sanctions. It's the actor that claimed to become a geopolitical actor, and that requires quite um, a lot of adaptations. Uh, the consensus uh, building process is quite painstaking because we're talking about 70, uh, 27 member states, and this is quite easy to, uh, well, basically um, come to a lower denominator sanctions level. And that might affect the, uh, the how we can deter Russia or coerce. Um, the lessons that the, the EU seems to be learning um, yesterday, Joseph Borrell said that they would be ready to convene a SNAP uh, foreign minister meeting. Usually the EU is quite slow and it tries to schedule sanctions. You cannot schedule sanctions if there is an, an imminent threat on uh, the Ukrainian border. So even this minor measure uh, to, to be more agile when it comes to discussing sanctions is already a welcome step. Uh, contingency measures could be developed because as we know, the um, discussion of sanctions can take some time. This uh, time it has been since November, member states have been discussing what type of sanctions will be imposed, uh, what happens if it's something short than an invasion. 
and all of this mapping can be done uh, preemptively before, and that's important that it, it will reduce the time lag between the, the imposition of sanctions and their discussion. Uh, also, the, there were some suggestions to uh, implement the qualitative majority voting that was floated in 2019. Unfortunately, this measure has not been uh, implemented, but we see a new um, tool that the EU has created, the so-called anti-corrosion uh, instrument that could be something see as a complementary to, to sanctions as well. And it's based on qualitative majority voting, presumably will be easier to trigger than sanctions, which require quite a lot of legwork uh, to, to trigger. Thanks very much, Maria. That that's uh, for this uh, exhaustive answer. Indeed, a, a huge question where the QMV could could come in. Um, I'm, I see just one question in the chat for the moment. I don't know how easy it is for for us to answer cover that one, uh, but but no, we can come back to it. I'm going to go forward with a second question. I, I also had in reserve. Um, again, it's on the on the broader picture. So, in in your view, what comes next? If we assume there is an armed attack, a serious uh, armed attack, which is such that it triggers the EU package, the US package, the UK and, and others, uh, can you then imagine additional packages of sanctions that would come on top of what you presented? Uh, and relatedly, would you support uh, the preparation of such additional packages of sanctions? Thank you. Yeah, well, the whole question, can the current sanctions package deter? And as we see so far, we didn't see this deterrent effect to the to the effect that Russia did withdrew some troops. And that can come down to how strategic messaging was done, how quickly uh, both the, the EU and the US were ready to, to table sanctions. So the, there are a lot of aspects to, to analyze before we can label success or non-success. But looking forward ahead of us, as I said, there are still quite uh, a few of these nuclear uh, sanctions options that are not currently on the table. And that could be part of the, the next sanctions package. There is also uh, the US obviously can, as I said, go an extra mile and the US extraterritorial sanctions is something that will be, well, I think mother of all sanctions can be <laughs> labeled for those because this will affect uh, uh, all connections because you don't need any U the US nexus for this and the US can target then quite a wide, a wide uh, number of entities and individuals for that. But it also, um, the, the range of new sanctions also depend on how resilient the EU is. If we're looking at the energy sector at the moment, obviously this is the sector that is non-touchable. 40% uh, of Russian gas uh, is imported by the EU and that makes the EU vulnerable. So in the, the longer term uh, discussion, we need to understand how uh, prepared the EU is to minimize those internal vulnerabilities and this could open then a uh, forum for new sanctions. Very good, thanks very much. And and since you're on that trajectory, I have my last question and then we'll, we'll broaden, uh, which is really how to understand the role of sanctions within a broader package of measures that, that Western states are trying to adopt uh, to, to, to face Russia. So to what degree do you believe that economic sanctions can be an effective deterrent? Uh, or is it is it rather something that is complementary to other measures, for example, military assistance or assistance to Ukraine in, in other ways? Um, how do you see the whole package and the relative importance of sanctions within an overall package? Uh, it's important to remember that sanctions is only one tool in the whole toolbox of economic statecraft and economic statecraft has all of the other tools that are potentially underutilized because we see a lot of uh, routine sanctions, uh, but there is uh, expert control, something that is discussed as a novel instrument in the Russian case that hasn't been widely used. 
Uh, the next one is foreign investment screening, again, uh, an instrument that could uh, screen the inbound investments. And this is again about this minimizing domestic vulnerabilities. And statecraft uh, starts from autonomy. If the actor is more uh, um, less vulnerable from within, it has more um, options to to exert its power externally. And if we look at the EU, it hasn't been doing a great job since 2014. As I said, Russia has been preparing better than the EU has done so. And we see quite a lot of vulnerabilities. If we look at the UK, it's obviously the anti-money laundering regulation regulation that needs to be uh, strengthened here. The current uh, government uh, in London uh, did expand uh, designation criteria for sanctions. Slapping sanctions on oligarchs can be a short-term solution, but it will need to be talking about overall strengthening of anti-money laundering regulation uh, as, as a long-term perspective. So this is one side of this discussion uh, as a uh, sticks. But the other one is positive sanctions or carrots. And in the Russian case, this is uh, in the Ukrainian Russian uh, crisis, this is help uh, to towards Ukraine. We saw that Ukraine has been already under economic pressure even before any invasion started, before any sanctions were in place on Russia. International airlines stopped flying to Kiev. Um, and this hits uh, Ukraine quite badly economically to, to withstand uh, anything militarily and also economically. So helping Ukraine to, to survive what is going through over the past eight years uh, will be quite important to bolster uh, its defense uh, internally. Um, and I think, yeah, I'll stop here. <laughs> Thanks very much uh, for this, Maria. But um, I see a couple of questions in the chat which are interesting. Um, I'll just throw in a, an, an extra idea, if you will. I mean, this is for reflection also for the audience. And that is that um, essentially you just mentioned the problem of flights being cancelled uh, about indirect costs that befall the, the Ukrainian economy. Um, of course, member states are very familiar with the traditional uh, topic of macro financial assistance. Uh, whether it's through the IMF or, or through other channels, uh, but it does raise the question, uh, and I'm, I'm leaving this open uh, as an open question, whether there might be other ways of supporting Ukraine economically uh, through perhaps some sort of insurance uh, scheme, uh, because effectively Ukraine has to now take over some sort of insurance function to reassure uh, foreign investors and foreign airlines. So perhaps uh, that is a, an instrument that could be worked on together with Ukraine's partners to try to soften the blow of, of the current uh, measures. So I'm, I'm leaving that open. If you want to pick it up later, uh, please, please do. I'm just going to pick up on the chat. Um, so Darius Liss asks, I think the first question might be difficult for us to answer, but if you have an idea, Maria, please, please say so. Uh, it's about um, whether we have at our disposal estimates of the costs to Russia of, of the sanctions package. Uh, I mean, I'm sure the member states do um, somewhere, but uh, maybe the other question, which is broader and, and sort of sort of interesting more from the dynamic uh, global picture is, are we moving towards or will this move us more towards a kind of bipolar economic uh, world order with the West on one side and Russia and China on the other. So uh, your your thoughts, please, Maria. Yeah, I'll try to, to unpack the, the first question as well. I think this is um, also to, to be careful not to concentrate too much on this macroeconomic level when it comes to sanctions. Again, going back to 2014, we know now that uh, sanctions um, impacted uh, uh, shaved about 0.2 percentage points from GDP every year from the Russian um, growth. That is not a lot, but sanctions rarely work in this blatant way where um, you see a drop in the GDP. They usually work in indirect ways. But what I mean is that they aggravate uh, economic um, prospects, economic growth, future investments. And if we look at the companies that were not sanctioned in Russia, they were also affected by sanctions because there are there is less appetite from the West to, to lend money, to invest in Russia. And if we look in long term, that will be quite a grim picture um, to 
on uh, for the prospects uh, uh, for the for the economic growth. On the second question, um, I think we're talking about multipolar uh, world here, less bipolar because bipolar here assumes that Russia and China are brothers in arms and allies. Uh, I see that their relationship is deepen, deepening and has been strengthened uh, quite substantially, but nevertheless, they now both claim that they are not allies. So this is there for, for everyone to see that they have differences. Uh, they might not go against each other um, in important uh, strategic uh, issues, uh, but they are not always with each other. Everyone uh, wants to guard uh, its sovereignty, this holy grail uh, for Russia, <laughs> understanding of how the world works and for China's. And also they have quite different interests. So what we see in terms of economic statecraft uh, that both Russia, China and the, the West also is not uh, um, homogeneous here, uh, they will employ more sanctions. Now China has created quite a few instruments mimicking what the West has done in terms of blocking in, uh, statute, its own sanctions, updated its own control. It hasn't used it quite actively, but at least the on the legislation level, the, the work is there. The EU, I said, as I said as well, is uh, getting ready to uh, shield itself from extraterritorial sanctions. And here we're not just talking about EU, but potentially Chinese extraterritorial sanctions. So I think we see bifurcation, not so much in two blocks, but a lot of players are trying to step up its defenses against global challenges in general. Thanks very much, Maria. And uh, I can hear sometimes some sound in the background. So if everybody else could please mute their microphones, I would be I would be most grateful. A um, couple of follow up questions in the chat. So so one is from our, our colleague Charlie. It's it's sort of related to this uh, in, insurance question. Um, uh, so let, let's have that on the side. So maybe you can pick it up, Maria, uh, in a moment. Uh, another that we can see from Darius Liss is could the sanctions be structured in such a way as to collect uh, a kind of a tax on the offender, meaning Russia, and transfer the proceeds to the to the victim. So uh, this is one which um, uh, this is one that I'll, I'll pick up if you don't mind, Maria. But please comment after me. But this is one of my one of my favorite uh, topics. Uh, so so I'll, I'll just start with that and unroll. Uh, so actually, of course, it is possible. Uh, there's no reason why it shouldn't be. Uh, once we find a mechanism that enables us to collect. Uh, revenue, for example, from an import tariff, uh, this would obviously make uh, revenue flow. And then we could, on our side, on the EU side, we could uh, choose to use it as we see fit. And why not use it to finance something that helps Ukraine? So uh, one proposal that I did make earlier this year uh, in a in a fear note uh, earlier this year was, uh, or commentary rather, uh, was to actually put an import tariff on imports from the Russian Federation into the European Union and to use part of the proceeds to cross subsidize or cross finance alternative supplies. So this could be done for Russian energy products or other mineral products uh, across the board. Uh, and this could be, uh, one could use the, the WTO uh, or the GATT treaty, rather there is a special clause on national security which could be deployed. So so yes, it is, it is possible. Um, but maybe Maria, back to you, uh, if you want to add to that, and if you want to make a comment maybe on insurance schemes, uh, helping with export guarantees or investment guarantees or other mechanisms we could think about to help Ukraine. Uh, I can't make better than, than you did on the tax proposals. I think you, you did an excellent publication on that. But it's interesting to, to know that in the Russian context, uh, decarbonization is called ecological sanctions on Russia. They they see it as, as a punishment instead of this long-term perspective uh, of climate change. And I think here the EU, uh, this, in the long-term perspective, can become less vulnerable uh, to be so much dependent on Russian gas. So by doing it in a 
in a structured way, not basically by replacing why one vulnerability on another. And here I mean Russian gas for Russian uh, blue hydrogen. In this way, the EU can put, uh, well, eggs in different baskets and not just um, in, in <laughs> Russia's. Because right now we're in the moment where only Russia can step up uh, supplies of gas. And again, for ambitious for ambitions of a geopolitical uh, actor that doesn't bode very well with strategic thinking. So decarbonization can definitely be something um, to to pick up uh, from the EU. Wonderful. Th thanks very much. Um, I guess we still have a few minutes left. I don't see many more many more questions. Um, but perhaps, Maria, if you want to wrap up on what, what are the key takeaways uh, and bearing in mind some of the participants and uh, our apologies again for the technical difficulties today. Uh, but some people did join the call uh, after you had started uh, speaking, uh, some two minutes in, some five, six minutes in. So some people might have missed a few elements. So maybe it's a good idea if you recap in, in two, three minutes, what are your five, six key messages? Uh, and then I'll, I'll conclude. Sure. I think it's important to, to think of sanctions. They, they are not a magic bullet, as I said. And while we have a sweeping uh, sanctions package, uh, it all depends on Russia's actions as well. Uh, first point is uh, the, the formula how sanctions work is based on a very rational idea that if you do this, we're going to impose sanctions. But what if Russia is not a fully rational player and it has already uh, factored in some sanctions, but also the, the Ukrainian case is very different here. There is certainly historical emotional attachment to Ukraine. So this can not be captured very well in, in rational terms. So we need to be also aware of, of the limitations of sanctions. The second point here, uh, what happens if this is something short of invasion? If it's an invasion, it's easy to galvanize support within the EU, between the allies transatlantically. But if it's something in the gray area between escalation and non-escalation, I think it will be much more difficult to trigger sanctions within the EU in particular. There is still no trigger point within the EU when to trigger if it's cyber attacks. Also, there is no agreement if what type of cyber attacks can trigger sanctions. And this ambiguity and uncertainty, I think, can be used by Russia because it often used these informal instruments and have very multiple options how to um, use different incursion techniques, whether it's, again, cyber attacks, disinformation campaigns or a general destabilization of the Ukrainian government. And these piecemeal tactics can be, well, quite successful in a way that we won't see the sweep in economic sanctions immediately. And this immediate uh, trigger point is also quite important. Um, on the last one uh, is something that uh, I think important to think long term. If we are running out of nuclear options and Russia is still not deterred, what is our strategy then? <laughs> because at this point, the sanctions is again only one instrument and I think uh, it cannot solve all of the historical grievances that, that Russia has and some sort of solution can be found, but here it's important not to um, to make this solution at the detriment of Ukraine's interests as well. Th thanks very much, Maria. That, that's truly, truly excellent. And uh, to, to conclude, I'll just um, add a couple of a couple of thoughts and make a couple of comments on also on the broader work at, at FIA. Um, of course, just on deterrence, of course, that that is an issue that, uh, whereas Miriam pointed out, uh, it's all part of a bigger package. So multiple measures come into consideration. And, and we all saw how a number of uh, friends and partners of Ukraine also supplied, for example, defensive uh, military equipment. So so those measures also mattered. We mentioned microfinancial uh, assistance and also some new ideas, for example, helping to ensure uh, the Ukrainian economy to, to help it withstand uh, shocks uh, that have been caused recently by the general fear of, of military action, uh, as well as uh, ideas to try to generate revenue from 
uh, from the situation, for example, by imposing import tariffs on, on Russian goods and using the proceeds to, to support Ukraine and to help our own resilience uh, with respect to uh, possible Russian hostilities. Um, to conclude, just to note that Maria's work, uh, as well as my own work, uh, that's all part of a larger team at FIA with a focus on geoeconomics, which includes sanctions, economic statecraft, but also other lines of effort to understand how states use economic means for ge geopolitical purposes and how other actors, be they states or corporations, uh, how they respond and adjust to the use of such means and what this may lead to in a longer term perspective, something Maria also touched on with this question about uh, bipolarity, multipolarity. With the team we have, which is led by Dr. Michael Vigal, uh, who couldn't be with us today, uh, we're able to take into account related developments pertaining, for example, to new and emerging technologies, uh, also something that came up today in the discussion with respect to export controls on, on technologies, uh, but also matters to do with national resilience and preparedness policies, uh, and of course, broader security policy uh, considerations. And so we're engaged in a number of research efforts on these topics, our, our work is gonna continue. Uh, and we very much hope to have further engagements and further seminars of this nature. Uh, please keep your eyes open on uh, Maria's work uh, and on her Twitter account uh, and on, on the FIA website, and we will continue to produce work uh, relating to sanctions to the Ukraine situation and to other geoeconomic topics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.